Hi, welcome to Aviation Theory. In this video, we will talk about temperature and heat, what they are, what are their main differences, their units of measurement, among other characteristics. So, let's get started. Let's start by looking at what is temperature. According to our daily experience, we could say that this is a measure of how cold or how hot an object or substance is. This way, if it is very hot, we say that it has a high temperature, and if it is very cold, we say that it has a low temperature. Now, at first glance, this seems to be correct, but this definition is far from the real concept of temperature. To understand this better, let's look at the following example. Here we have a glass of water at rest, which means that at a macroscopic level, the water does not appear to be moving. However, if we observe water at the microscopic level, we will realize that in fact the water molecules are in constant motion, colliding with each other. This continuous movement of the molecules at the microscopic level is known as internal energy, and it is not only present in water, but in any other body or substance. Now, as we already know, energy in the form of movement is known as kinetic energy, which is expressed by means of the translation, rotation, or vibration of the molecules. So, with this in mind, the molecules of a certain object or substance can move, rotate, and vibrate more rapidly or more slowly, depending on their internal energy. This way, if they move slowly, then we say that they have less kinetic energy, while if they move faster, it means that they have more kinetic energy. Now, understanding all this, we can now move on to the actual concept of temperature. And it is that temperature is the average of the kinetic energy of the molecules of a body or substance. In simple words, this means that the faster the molecules of a body move, the higher its internal energy, and thus the higher its temperature. This way, we can also say that temperature measures the degree of agitation of the molecules of a body or substance. Now, it is important to clarify that we say that the temperature is the average kinetic energy, since within the same substance not all molecules move in the same way, as there may be molecules that move faster than others. So, in this order of ideas, if we analyze a single molecule, the concept of temperature makes no sense. It only makes sense if we analyze a large group of molecules at the macroscopic level. So, now that we know what is temperature, let's move on to the concept of heat. Heat, in essence, is a form of energy, and we can think of it as the sum of the kinetic energy of all the molecules of a body or substance. So, unlike temperature, we are no longer talking about the average energy of each molecule, but rather the sum of the energy of all molecules. Now, technically what we have just said corresponds to the concept of thermal energy or heat energy. While heat as such refers more to the transfer of that thermal energy, but for the sake of simplicity in this explanation, we will use these terms interchangeably. Now, so far we may still have some confusion about the difference between temperature and heat, so let's look at a couple of practical examples. Suppose we have here two containers with the same amount of water. However, the difference is that the water in container A has a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, and the water in container B is at 70 degrees Celsius. With this, it is evident that in average, the water molecules in container B are moving faster than in container A, hence its higher temperature. But what happens with heat? Which of them contains more heat? Well, since the amount of water is the same in both cases, it is evident that if we sum up the kinetic energy of each individual molecule, the water in container B will also have more heat than container A. Now, this example was kind of intuitive, as we normally associate higher temperature with more heat and vice versa. But let's look at this other situation. Here we have water in two containers at the same temperature. The difference is that container A now contains 100 liters and container B only 10 liters. In this case, the average kinetic energy is the same in both containers, and therefore their temperature is the same. However, if we sum up the energy of each individual molecule, since container A has more water molecules, then it will have much more heat than container B. So, as we could see, although temperature and heat are related concepts, 
there is not always a direct relationship between them. In fact, a substance with a lower temperature may have more heat than one with a higher temperature. A clear example of this is, for example, if we compare the temperature and heat of a cup of coffee with the ocean. In this case, although the ocean has a lower temperature than a cup of coffee, since it contains many more molecules, this means that it has much more heat. In fact, the large amount of heat contained in the ocean is capable of generating violent atmospheric phenomena, such as hurricanes. So, having all this clear, let's look at the following example. Here we have two containers with different amounts of water, but at the same temperature. Now let's say that we expose both containers to an external heat source. In this way, after a certain time, say 5 minutes, it is logical to think that the temperature of the water in both cases will have increased. However, the thing is that in container B, the temperature increased by 20 degrees, which is a lot, while in container A, it only increased a couple of degrees. This happened because in container A, the incoming heat had to be distributed over the 100 liters of water, which increases the average kinetic energy of the system very little. While on the other hand, in container B, the same amount of heat was distributed over only 10 liters of water, which increased the average kinetic energy of the system a lot. Now, it is important to note that in this example, heat is being transferred from the bonfire to the water. And the thing is that heat can be transferred from one body to another only if they have different temperatures. This way, and according to the laws of thermodynamics, heat is always transferred from a body at a higher temperature to a body at a lower temperature. This heat transfer will take place until thermal equilibrium is reached. This thermal equilibrium means that both substances or objects reach the same temperature, and therefore the heat transfer stops. This heat transfer can occur by means of different processes, specifically conduction, radiation, and convection, but we will talk about them in more detail in a future video. Now, at this point, you might be wondering what happens if a body loses all its heat? Well, in that case, its molecules will not move or vibrate at all, since they will have lost all of their kinetic energy, as we can see in this example. In this situation, we say that the body has reached the temperature of absolute zero, which by definition is the lowest possible temperature. So, having seen this, let's move on to the units of measurement of temperature. Although there are different scales, the most commonly used are Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. Now, normally the freezing and boiling points of water, as well as the absolute zero, are used as a reference to compare these scales. According to this, absolute zero is represented by zero Kelvin, minus 273 degrees Celsius, and minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit. The freezing point of water is represented by 273 Kelvin, 0 degrees Celsius, and 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And finally, the boiling point of water is represented by 373 Kelvin, 100 degrees Celsius, and 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Here we can see the most commonly used conversion factors between these units. As we can see in the formula at the bottom, the relationship between Kelvin and Celsius is quite simple, as they have a direct relation with a difference of 273 units. While on the other hand, the conversion from Fahrenheit to Celsius and vice versa is a bit more complex, as it involves using fractions. However, we can also use a factor of 1.8 with these other formulas if it results more convenient. So, having seen the different temperature scales, let's move on to the instrument used to measure it, which is the thermometer. There are different types of thermometers depending on their principle of operation. The most commonly used in meteorology and aviation are the bimetallic, mercury, and electrical resistance thermometers. However, it is important to clarify that besides these, there are other types of thermometers used for different purposes, such as the infrared and thermocouple thermometers. Now, apart from the thermometer, another instrument used in meteorology is the thermograph, which is used to record temperature over time using a constantly moving paper. This instrument allows to analyze temperature behavior and therefore predict future changes in weather conditions. Now, of course, it is important that both the thermometer and the thermograph be located in a place 
where they can give a correct reading of the actual air temperature. It is for this reason that these instruments are installed inside a Stevenson screen, also known as instrument shelter. This is basically a specially designed structure that ensures a proper air temperature measurement, since it prevents it from being affected by solar radiation, precipitation, or surface heating. So, to achieve the best level of accuracy in the temperature measurement, this structure is designed so that the instruments are located at a height between 1.2 and 2 meters above the surface, and at a distance of about 4 meters from other structures. Now, this is how air temperature is measured at the surface. But if what we want is to measure the temperature at different altitudes, then radiosondes attached to weather balloons are used, which are launched from the surface up to an altitude of approximately 65,000 feet. These devices consist of a radiosonde that contains the different measuring instruments, a radar reflector that allows to track its position, and the balloon itself. However, we have to say that to track its position more accurately, most modern models incorporate a GPS antenna instead of radar reflectors. So far, we have seen how temperature is measured. Let's now see how we can measure heat. So, since heat is a form of energy, it can be measured as such, using joules, which is the standard unit of measurement of the international system. However, in some cases, it is more practical to measure it in terms of the amount of energy required to change the temperature of a body or substance, which can be done by means of the calorie. By definition, a calorie is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Specifically, it corresponds to the energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water from 14.5 to 15.5 degrees Celsius under standard conditions at sea level. With all this in mind, we can say that one calorie is equal to 4,186 joules. Now, it is important to note that not all materials and substances require the same amount of heat to change their temperature, as this depends on their specific heat. By definition, specific heat is the amount of heat required for the temperature of a body or substance to increase by 1 degree Celsius. To understand it better, let's look at the following example. Let's say we have 1 kilogram of two different materials at the same temperature, in this case 15 degrees Celsius, and the objective is to increase its temperature by 1 degree. Now, Let's say that according to their characteristics, the material A needs less heat than the material B to increase its temperature. This way, we can say that material A has a lower specific heat than material B. Now, this concept of specific heat is directly related to the heat capacity of a material. In simple terms, heat capacity is the ability of a material to absorb a lot of heat without changing its temperature very much. So according to this, we could say that material A has a low heat capacity, since it changes its temperature pretty easily with small amounts of heat. While on the other hand, material B has a high heat capacity, since it is able to absorb or release large amounts of heat without changing its temperature too much. With this in mind, we have to say that each material or substance has a certain specific heat, which determines how easily its temperature changes with heat transfer. Here we can see a table with the specific heat of different substances and materials. Let's look at a practical example using this information. As we can see, water has a specific heat of 1 calorie per gram per degree Celsius, while iron has a specific heat of 0.11, which is almost 10 times lower than water. So, According to this, if we had the same amount of water and iron at the same temperature, and we expose them to a heat source of 1000 calories, their temperature would change differently. In the case of water, since it has a high heat capacity, its temperature increases by only 1 degree. While in the case of iron, which has a lower heat capacity, its temperature will increase almost 10 times more, in this case, 9 degrees. So, with all that we have discussed so far, it is natural to think that whenever heat is added to a body or substance, its temperature will increase according to its specific heat, and in most cases, this is true. This heat used to increase the temperature of a body or substance is known as sensible heat. However, there is another effect that heat input to a body can produce, and it is a change of state. 
During this process, despite the fact that heat is being added, the temperature remains constant. And this is because the heat is being used to change the state of the body or substance, rather than for increasing its temperature. This heat used to change state is known as latent heat. Latent heat is defined as the heat that is released or absorbed by a body or substance during a change of state, while the temperature remains constant. For example, for water to change from solid to liquid state, latent heat is required to produce the change of state. In the same way, to change from liquid to gaseous state, latent heat is also required. Now, since this latent heat is not used to change the temperature, it remains somewhat hidden inside the body or substance, until it is eventually released when the opposite change of state takes place. For example, to change from gaseous to liquid state, the latent heat that was absorbed during the vaporization is now released. And the same happens when the water changes from liquid to solid state. Latent heat is now released to the environment. In this way, we could summarize that latent heat is energy that is used to change state, rather than changing temperature, and it is absorbed or released depending on the process involved. With all these concepts clear, let's look at a final example where we can observe the relationship between sensible and latent heat. Suppose we have an ice cube at a temperature of minus 30 degrees Celsius, and we start adding heat to it. So, initially the temperature of the ice cube will start to increase gradually, and therefore, since the heat is being used to increase the temperature, then we say that it is sensible heat. Now, this will happen until the temperature reaches 0 degrees Celsius, which is the freezing point of water. From this point on, the heat absorbed by the ice cube will not be used to increase its temperature, but to change from solid to liquid state. This means that this is no longer sensible heat, it is now latent heat. And during all this process, the temperature will remain constant at zero degrees. Now, when the ice has completely melted, the heat will again be used to increase the temperature of the water. So again, we have sensible heat. This will happen up to a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, which is the boiling point of water. From this point on, the incoming heat will be used to change from liquid to gaseous state, which means that it is now latent heat again, and therefore the temperature will remain constant at 100 degrees until all the water has evaporated. Once that happens, the heat will be used again to increase the temperature of the water vapor, and therefore it is now sensible heat again. So, with this we have now understood the basics of how heat and temperature behave, which is essential to understand the development of most meteorological phenomena that we will be looking at in future videos. I hope the information presented in this video was useful. If so, don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below, it would help me a lot. Thanks for watching, and I see you next time.